There's tremendous interest in therapeutics for COVID-19, a, a viral infection for which we have no proven therapies. In this talk, I will discuss different potential options for treatment of COVID-19. These are my disclosures. And this is an outline for, for my talk. I'll review briefly uh, how successful we've been in developing antiviral therapies for uh, viral infections over the last uh, uh, 40 or 50 years and where we stand today. Talk about which avenues for therapeutic intervention exist for COVID-19 and then review the data on antivirals, immune response modifiers, inhibitors of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the potential use of convalescent serum, challenges in conducting drug trials in viral respiratory infections, and end with a brief discussion of the possibility of post-exposure post prophylaxis. We've really been enormously successful in developing therapy for a variety of viral illnesses since uh, the dawn of the AIDS era in the early 1980s, at which point we had very few antiviral drugs. Uh, when AIDS uh, first hit, we only had a cyclovir for herpes virus infection, the adamantanes for influenza, and then ribavirin had some very limited uses. But there's been the rapid development of novel antiviral and antiretroviral drugs uh, uh, over the last uh, 40 years. We now have more than 30 approved antiretroviral drugs and drug combinations. We've seen a spate of uh, novel drugs approved for the treatment of uh, herpes simplex virus and uh, varicella zoster virus, as well as new drugs for the treatment of cytomegalovirus. In addition, beyond the adamantanes, which are no longer used, we have numerous uh, drugs for the treatment of influenza, including the neuraminidase inhibitors, and most recently, approval of the CAP-dependent and a nuclease inhibitor. And uh, on the immunological front, we have the use of broadly neutralizing antibodies for Ebola. So there's every reason to be optimistic that in the next months or year, uh, we could find effective therapy for uh, SARS-CoV-2, the agent of coronavirus infectious disease uh, 2019. Well, what are some of those treatment options? We might use antiviral drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, as well as convalescent serum. So let's go through these systematically. The first antiviral drugs to be considered included the protease inhibitors that are used for treatment of HIV, uh, particularly lopinavir ritonavir. Now, this seems a bit puzzling since uh, the protease inhibitors for HIV are aspartyl acid proteases, whereas the proteases of SARS-CoV-2 are serine proteases. And generally speaking, HIV proteases show exquisite uh, uh, specificity uh, for the HIV protease. But there was some evidence from a retrospective case control series uh, suggesting the benefit of uh, boosted lopinavir in the original SARS epidemic of more than a decade ago, and evidence from in vitro studies of modest activity of lopinavir against the current SARS-CoV-2. Uh, now that's shown in this upper uh, right-hand panel here, where you see with an EC50 of just under 12 micromolar, uh, you can get uh, complete inhibition of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 with uh, lopinavir. So uh, a randomized clinical trial was conducted in China that uh, took patients who had uh, severe COVID-19 disease and randomized them either to lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, or control, and found no benefit overall in terms of uh, the cumulative rate of improvement as assessed by a variety of parameters. One intriguing finding in that study, however, was that in the subgroup of individuals treated early in infection before 12 days of illness, there was a signal that there might be a benefit. And so the door is not completely closed yet on the potential utility of the boosted PIs for treatment of COVID-19. There's considerable interest in the use of hydroxychloroquine, a drug that has gotten a lot of attention in the press. Hydroxychloroquine, which is a derivative of chloroquine, a drug used for uh, centuries now for the treatment of malaria, uh, is approved for the treatment of rheumatologic diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. There are two potential modes of action for hydroxychloroquine against COVID-19. One as a direct antiviral, because the drug inhibits the acidification of endosomal and phagocytic vesicles, 
uh, which are the pathway for virus entry. And secondly, as a potential anti-inflammatory drug that may diminish uh, inflammation in the lung. In vitro studies show that both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine inhibit SARS-CoV-2 uh, with an IC50 of uh, approximately four micromolar uh, at the multiplicity of infection of uh, 0.02 infectious uh, units uh, per, uh, per culture. There have been mixed results from a series of small, mostly uh, uncontrolled clinical trials, and one intriguing study that uh, examined the uh, rate of positivity uh, in uh, oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal swabs uh, from individuals who were hospitalized for a, a SARS-CoV-2 infection and received either hydroxychloroquine alone, shown in the blue line, or hydroxychloroquine uh, plus azithromycin, uh, shown in the green line, as compared to controls. A major limitation of this study, aside from the fact that it wasn't a randomized uh, or blinded study, uh, is that uh, several of the patients actually had progressive disease and were uh, intubated and uh, admitted to the intensive care unit, at which time they were no longer being sampled, uh, and that uh, uh, creates a certain amount of bias. Nevertheless, there is uh, uh, enough interest in this approach that there are now several uh, large clinical trials being proposed either of hydroxychloroquine or of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin uh, for the treatment of patients with uh, COVID-19. Remdesivir is an RNA polymerase inhibitor uh, with in vitro activity against a number of RNA viruses, including Ebola, SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. The uh, upper right-hand panel shows the inhibition curve, and you can see that um, the uh, IC50 here uh, is much lower than what we saw previously for either hydroxychloroquine or for lopinavir. It's actually sub-micromolar, about 0.8 uh, micromolar. Uh, th th this drug was actually tested in phase three clinical trials against Ebola, so there's quite a lot known about its uh, safety in uh, human populations. Uh, unfortunately, it was inferior to uh, BNABs against Ebola, uh, which is a cautionary note in terms of what we might expect uh, of remdesivir in, uh, hum uh, in the treatment of uh, COVID-19. On the more optimistic side, however, uh, this drug was quite effective against MERS in both murine and in non-human primate models. Uh, these uh, histological slides uh, show protection against lung injury uh, in uh, infected uh, rhesus macaques uh, treated with remdesivir as compared to those who were treated with uh, a control uh, infusion. You can see the extensive uh, amount of material, uh, intraalveolar material and inflammatory cells here as compared to the remdesivir treated animals and then compared to the uninfected uh, controls. Uh, in addition, uh, in the uh, macaque model, which also included uh, looking at um, uh, the preventive use of remdesivir, uh, there was a substantial reduction in uh, the amount of virus in respiratory secretions in the uh, treated animals uh, who uh, were treated after infection and substantial protection against acquisition of infection uh, when used in a prophylactic setting. Uh, there are now numerous uh, ongoing randomized clinical trials of remdesivir in both moderate and severe COVID-19 uh, uh, infection, and we look forward to the results of those trials. Favipiravir is a broad-spectrum viral RNA polymerase inhibitor that's approved for use against influenza in Japan, although it is not approved uh, in the United States and in uh, several other countries. This drug, uh, in contrast to what we saw for um, remdesivir, has a much higher EC50 in vitro, about 62 micromolar, but that is a concentration that is achievable uh, with uh, current dosing. Um, there have been non-randomized pilot studies showing faster clearance of SARS-CoV-2 in patients who received favipiravir compared to those who received boosted lopinavir, uh, as shown in this slide here. And you can see the rapid uh, loss of, um, of positivity from uh, nasal swabs in the favipiravir group uh, compared to the lopinavir group. 
As a consequence, there are several trials that are either planned or underway uh, for this drug, uh, which is uh, well tolerated and whose pharmacokinetics are well understood. Leaving behind uh, specific antiviral drugs, there's a great interest in the potential role of this immune response modifiers. And that's because if we look at the pathogenesis and the clinical course of, of COVID-19, uh, there's an initial phase, a phase of infection of, that's characterized as early infection, which is really uh, when viral infection is predominating. Uh, that moves on to the pulmonary phase and then moves into a host inflammatory response phase. And it's this third hyperinflammatory phase that's accompanied by extensive lung injury in the 15 to 20% of individuals who develop uh, severe COVID-19. And it's in this setting I, that uh, antiviral therapy is uh, unlikely to offer additional uh, benefit, but where anti-inflammatory therapy may have uh, significant uh, uh, utility. Uh, this second phase is characterized by generalized immune activation and so-called cytokine storms with very high levels of interleukin-6, and therefore monoclonal antibodies that block the IL-6, IL-6 receptor access may be effective in preventing or moderating immune-mediated lung injury. Pilot studies of tocilizumab, an IL-6 receptor blocker, show decreases in C-reactive protein, as shown in this panel here, uh, and uh, resolution of fever, as shown in this uh, panel here. As a result, there are several clinical trials that are either planned or underway. Uh, one, a randomized study of tocilizumab, another study of cerilumab, uh, which is another IL-6 receptor antagonist, uh, and a study of uh, zidecumab, uh, which is a um, IL-6 uh, antibody. The SARS-CoV-2 gains entry into the cell by binding to the uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 uh, a molecule bound to the cell surface and then is uh, engulfed in these endocytic vesicles uh, and gains entry uh, uh, into the cytoplasm from there. There's an interaction between uh, the um, renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the ACE2 receptor such that when, uh, uh, when this axis is uh, inhibited either by the use of uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme 1 inhibitors or angiotensin-2 receptor blockers, there is an increase in the level of ACE2 uh, expression on the cell surface. Uh, that has raised some concern as to whether the use of um, <clears throat> these uh, uh, RAS inhibitors, as they're called, uh, may exacerbate uh, COVID-19. Um, by, uh, by contrast, SARS-CoV-2 infection itself downregulates uh, ACE2 expression. But that could result in unopposed angiotensin II accumulation uh, and generalized RAS activation. Um, it's known that RAS blockade limits lung injury in mice exposed to the SARS-CoV-1 spike protein. That's the envelope protein from the original uh, SARS uh, coronavirus uh, that caused the epidemic uh, a decade ago. Um, and whether a uh, blockade of this uh, axis in uh, COVID-19 would be beneficial uh, or harmful uh, is an area of active investigation. There's considerable interest in the potential role of convalescent serum uh, in the treatment and prevention of COVID-19. Convalescent serum from survivors of COVID-19 infection might contain high titers of neutralizing antibody. Uh, in other settings, convalescent serum has been shown to have some benefit in the treatment of avian influenza due to H1N5 uh, and in the H1N1 influenza epidemic of 2009, and has also had uh, some benefit in certain patients with MERS. A recent uncontrolled pilot study of only five participants suggested a possible benefit of uh, convalescent serum uh, in uh, patients with severe COVID-19 infection uh, this study that was just published in JAMA uh, showed uh, that uh, four of the five intubated patients were able to be weaned off of mechanical ventilation. And that was associated with uh, decreasing uh, titers of uh, virus in their respiratory secretions as shown by the increasing uh, time it took for their PCR tests to uh, become positive uh, in terms of uh, cycle uh, time, resolution of a number of clinical parameters of uh, acuity, uh, improvements in their 
uh, oxygenation and uh, resolution of fever. There are, however, theoretical concerns that convalescent serum might contain not only neutralizing antibodies, but also enhancing antibodies. And so the use of convalescent serum could be a double-edged sword. Uh, nevertheless, there are uh, a number of uh, clinical trials that are either uh, being planned or already underway. One of the important things to keep in mind in uh, assessing all of these interventions is that it is incredibly challenging to conduct trials of therapeutics for respiratory viral pathogens. Studies in influenza have consistently shown maximal benefit when the drug is started within the first few days after symptom onset. And that is generally because those progressing to severe infection uh, are um, uh, suffering from the immunologic consequences of infection and no longer so much from ongoing virus replication. Accelerated viral clearance from respiratory secretions by itself uh, may not correlate with faster clinical improvement. An immune-mediated lung injury is unlikely to be modified by antivirals given late in the course of disease. The availability of several candidates as approved drugs uh, that can be uh, prescribed by treating physicians also complicates the conduct of clinical trials, making it much harder to conduct studies that have a blinded placebo, uh, and uh, there needs to be careful discussion with uh, local uh, ethics boards about what is the appropriate way of proceeding uh, with these studies. Lastly, combinations of antiviral and anti-inflammatory drugs may be required for maximal benefit. Let me end with a brief discussion of uh, the potential role of some of these agents for post-exposure prophylaxis. There is considerable interest in the use of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare workers and close contacts of persons with COVID-19. Uh, we know that uh, hydroxychloroquine is reasonably safe, it's orally bioavailab bio bioavailable, uh, and is uh, relatively inexpensive, making it uh, fairly attractive uh, for this purpose. As a result, there are now several large multicenter trials that are either already underway or uh, in late stages of, uh, of planning. But we have to ask, what is the relevant endpoint here? Are we attempting to merely prevent symptomatic COVID-19 infection, or do we want to prevent any uh, acquisition of SARS-CoV-2 since uh, uh, asymptomatic infection may be uh, an important uh, mechanism by which infection is spread in the community? Of course, it's much easier to uh, detect the presence of symptomatic infection uh, uh, compared to detecting a carriage of virus, which requires a frequent sampling of, uh, uh, with nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, which has all kinds of complications of its own, given limitations in test availability and the need for personal protective equipment when doing uh, nasopharyngeal uh, sampling. And then, in the context of an ongoing pandemic, uh, is uh, Prevention of uh, ex uh, infection following a single known exposure sufficient, or are we really talking about ongoing prevention, more like uh, we use PrEP, especially uh, in the setting of healthcare workers who may have a continuous and ongoing exposure to COVID? I hope uh, this uh, brief summary of uh, potential therapeutic options has been uh, helpful, and I'll turn this back over to our moderators.